Hey guys, what's up? Unrested here, and I'm just stopping in for a really quick Osoroshi Saturday. Sorry, this is a shortened episode, but like I said, working hard on the summer compilation of huge amounts of ghost videos, ghost stories, and everything else. Let's jump into today's, and this is known as Japan's Hinterkaifeck murder. If you don't know what the Hinterkaifeck murder is, it's a famous murder in Germany in which an entire family was murdered by an axe murderer and he was never found and it was very mysterious. You're going to find today very much the same thing. And this, the Seta Gaia family murder, refers to the unsolved murder of the Miyazawa family in Seta Gaia ward of Tokyo, Japan, 30th of December, the year 2000. In this murder, Mikio Miyazawa and Yasuko and Nina, as well as their son, Ray, were murdered during a home invasion at night by an unknown assailant who then remained in Miyazawa's house for several hours after they murdered and then disappeared into the night. The Japanese police launched a massive investigation that uncovered the killer's DNA, as well as many specific clues about their identity, but the perpetrator has never been identified. The media frenzy and a long investigation of the Setagaya murders became a cause to abolish the statute of limitations in Japan, which was removed in 2010. On the 31st of December, the year 2000, the corpses of 44-year-old Mikio, his wife, 41-year-old Yasuko, their children, 8-year-old Nina, and 6-year-old Rei, were discovered by Yasuko's mother, Asahi Geno, at their house in Kami-so Shigaya neighborhood of Setagaya in western suburbs of Tokyo. Mikio, Yasuko, and Nina had been stabbed to death while Ray had been strangled. Investigation of the crime scene by the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department concluded that the family had been murdered on December 30th at around 11.30 p.m., after which the killer stayed in the house for several hours after. The Miyazawa's killer entered through the open window of the second-floor bathroom at the rear of the house, located immediately adjacent to Soshigaya Park, and gained access by climbing up a tree, then removing a window screen. The killer used his bare hands to strangle Ray, who was sleeping in his room on the second floor, killing him through asphyxiation. Mikio rushed up to the first floor stairs after he detected a disturbance in Ray's room, fighting and injuring a killer until being stabbed in the head with a sashimi bochou knife, which is a knife used to cut fine slivers of fish to serve as sashimi. A police report claimed that the part of the sashimi's knife blade broke off inside of Mikio's head, and the killer then attacked Yasuko and Nina with the broken knife until using a santoku knife from the Miyazawa's house to murder them. The killer remained inside the Miyazawa's house for two to ten hours using the family computer, consuming mogi chi and melon as well as ice cream from their refrigerator, using their toilet, treating his injuries, using a first aid kit and other sanitary products, as well as taking a nap on the sofa on the second floor living room. An analysis of Mikio Miyazawa's computer revealed that it had connected to the internet the morning after the murders at 1.18 a.m. and again at around 10 a.m., around the time Yasuko's mother, Asahi, entered the house and discovered the murders. Asahi became suspicious after being unable to call her daughter as the killer had unplugged the phone line. She visited the house but received no answer after ringing the doorbell. Authorities believe the killer had stayed in the house until at least 1.18 a.m., but the computer usage at 10 a.m. could have also accidentally been triggered by Asahi discovering the crime scene. Investigation 
police have been able to deduce several very specific clues to the perpetrator's identity, but have been unable to produce and apprehend a suspect. It was determined that the killer had eaten string beans and sesame seeds the previous day after analyzing the feces from the killer in the Miyazawa's bathroom toilet. They determined that the clothes and sashimi knife left behind by the killer had been purchased in Kanagawa Prefecture. Police also learned that only 130 units of the killer's sweater were made and sold, but they have only been able to track down 12 of the people who bought the sweaters. So the clothing he was wearing is completely unique and a great clue. The investigation into the murders is among the largest in Japanese history, involving over 246 thousand investigators who've collected over 12,000 pieces of evidence. As of 2015, 40 officers were still assigned to the case. Every year, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department makes an annual pilgrimage to the house for a memorial. The Seijo Police Station is designated to continue to investigate the case. The Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department is currently offering 20 million yen to any person who can help the officers find clues that lead to a suspect. The suspect. Tokyo police found the killer's DNA and fingerprints in the Miyazawa's house, but none matched the database of Tokyo police, indicating they did not have a criminal record. The killer's blood was gained during an analysis of the murder scene that reveals traces of type A blood which would not have belonged to the Miyazawa family. A DNA analysis of the type A blood determined the killer is a male and possibly mixed race, with maternal DNA indicating a mother of European descent and possibly a South European country near the Mediterranean or Adriatic Sea, and paternal DNA indicating a father of East Asian descent. It is considered possible that the European maternal DNA comes from a distant ancestor from the mother's line rather than a fully European mother. Analysis of the Y chromosome showed the Hapel group 0M122, a common health group distributed in the East Asian peoples, appearing in 1 to 4 or 5 Koreans, 1 in 10 Chinese, and 1 in 13 Japanese. These results led to the Tokyo Metropolitan Police to seek assistance through the International Crime Police Organization as the killer may not be Japanese or present in Japan. Physically, the killer is believed to be around 170 centimeters tall with a thin build. The police estimate the killer was born between 1965 and 1985, 15 to 35 years old at the time of the incident due to the physics required to entering the Miyazawa's house and committing the murders. The Miyazawa's wounds indicate that the killer is likely to be right-handed. Now, what do I think about all of this? Well, personally, I would go with it being a out-of-country killer if after all these years with DNA, blood, and all these different things left over as far as a sweater that the killer was wearing that there was only 13 made of in Japan. It seems like it would be incredibly easy to track this person down if they still lived in the country, which I'm guessing they do not. Now, what country is this person from? (sighs) That's hard to say. Um, One aspect, though, that was not included in this article that I read Later and other parts was that they believe this killer was possibly a skateboarder who skateboarded at a skate park that was nearby. And that was something I thought was left out that would probably be pretty important. I myself skateboard and although I don't think many skateboarders are murderers, I think that would also play a huge part as that can actually change scuffs on the shoes and be another source of evidence. Whether or not that was taken into consideration, I don't know. What I would like to know is what do you guys think? With all the clues that you heard today, where do you think this killer's from? Why do you think the police haven't found them? And 
What would be the motive even? They don't even give a good motive as to why. One small article that I found about the skate park said that the family had been angry that a skate park had been built nearby and they had actually yelled at skateboarders for being too loud. But it's it's hard to believe that a skateboarder would murder an entire family over them complaining about them being too loud. But crazier things have happened. So I can't put that totally past the idea of truer than fiction. So again, let me know in the comments down below. Again, I apologize for this being a shorter episode. Nonetheless, I'd love to hear your feedback on it. And I think possibly either next week or the week after, I'm going to start showing some very long versions of Osiroshi Saturday with a whole bunch of ghost stories and real ghosts, which is ghosts on film. Until next time, I am unrested. I will talk to you again real soon. Have a good one.